uh, today, if I were to say to my friends that I was interviewing you on this book, you would be immediately classified as a right-wing bhakt. I would be classified as a tukre tukre gang. And both of our social circles would be quite horrified that we were attempting a conversation. And I actually don't remember when that happened to our country because I did not go seeking friendships um, based on politics, at least not in the narrow sense. Politics was a very deep word for us. So the kind of polarity that we trigger in each other's spaces, familial and personal and social, uh, is the new reality of our time. It is. And just before I ask you my next question, let's have a show of hands. Do you make friends today? Can you be friends with someone who you do not ideologically agree with? If yes, raise your hand. So that's a reasonable show of hands. And that is what always makes me feel that outside of the world of WhatsApp forwards, outside of the world of Twitter, outside of the world of sort of mobilized politics, the world actually isn't the way we imagine it to be. But everybody's either a traitor or an enabler, depending on your point of view. You recited from Matthew Arnold, one of the lines in your book is, um, poetry or poems are preferable to slogans. If so, Professor Parajpai, why do you endorse a slogan like the Tukre Tukre Gang so broadly in such a sweeping way without complexity? What does it mean? No, I don't do it. Why do you attribute to no, me what I haven't done? No, it's in the book and done? it's become no, shorthand to describe a certain… Yeah. It's in the blurb, but if you look through the book, you know, I never say, say that, and by the way, I've even said that some of these slogans, we don't know who chanted them. If you read the book mm. carefully, yeah. I've even said that certainly Kanaya Kumar, to name my, so to speak, significant other in that debate, you know, he didn't cite them. But you know, the point, Barkha, is deeper, which is that uh, there is a cancel culture and political correctness has swept through universities all over the world. And I call it the Pancha Bakar in JNU. I mean, I'm coming back to JNU because the book is about JNU. So what happens is the Pancha Bakar is, in a way, <laughs> you know, like in Tantra, there's the Pancha Makar. And that was, I would say, a sanctioned or supervised subversion. Uh, what was it for? It was to expand your consciousness. It was to free you from those sanctimonious and sometimes sanitized social mores, which in fact confine a lot of us, right? So Tantra allowed you to break those, uh, as it were, you know, those patterns of conditioning through the Pancha Makar. We need go into that. But in JNU was Pancha Bakar, which is the opposite, which is a way to constrict consciousness, which is a way to ideologize and not intellectualize issues. So let me just tell our friends what the Pancha Bakar is, yeah. because you yourself said that if you told somebody you were talking to me, they'd say, oh, that's Sanghi, right? Yeah. So the first thing they do is they brand you. So I came to JNU and I was already branded as some kind of right-wing guy. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the basis of that was. If you're using terminology such as dharma or karma, etc., you got branded because these are intellectual categories and I still use them. Anyhow, first step is branding. The second step is brainwashing. So people come to you and say, you know, what, what are you doing? Why are you on this side? These guys are fascists, whatever. So there's a, you know, way to try to influence you and try to wean you away from your perceived ideological leanings, you know. So, as I said, branding, then brainwashing, the third step is bullying, bullying, browbeating, you know, subtle threats, etc. If those don't work, since I was a full professor, that didn't work with me, there was nothing they could withhold from me otherwise, but they did, like foreign trips, whatever little gravy train, you know, you can pick up as a teacher, which is really piffling, but still, the way people compete for these handouts, it's funny. Anyhow, so bullying and then if that doesn't work then it's a boycott so you organize a conference no one shows up this has happened to me and even students boycott you because i caught a lot of students for plagiarizing and i wanted to fail them my colleagues said don't fail them 
etc., etc. I won't go into that. But then for, for years, nobody wanted to do their PhD with me. I'm just giving an example, so boycott. And the final thing is, pardon the language, BS, bullshit. In other words, they just entangle you in some useless stuff. Like I had dozens of open letters written against me. My colleagues wrote against me. Some students wrote letters and it was, you know, full of the strawman fallacy, ad hominem, all kinds of nonsense, diversions, div you know, deflections. It was nothing I said or did. It was false attribution. And then I got, you know, embroiled in these animad versions, as I call them, these debates where, but luckily, I mean, it was a learning experience yeah. for me. But so, ju just to finish my point, the point I'm trying to make is that the pancha makar is supposed to expand your consciousness. The pancha makar constricts it and contains it. And unfortunately, you read out, somebody, Deepa read out at the beginning that JNU is a place of dissent, etc. I found my students, they don't read Marx, they haven't read Engels, you know, they haven't read Horkheimer, they haven't read Marcuse, whatever. So, this is the dumbing down, what I call the dark ages is that the university, which should be a place of learning and questioning and debating, is captured by people who don't believe in those values. And this is the dangerous point. You know, yeah. why, why I stepped in, if you allow me to say this, I felt that the university was not a space where 100 or 150 students could turn uh, the whole campus into a platform against an elected government. I thought that there was something really wrong with that because they were preventing the others from studying. And for eight months, for yeah. eight months, we had no classes at all. And all of this was countenanced because of ideology. So, you don't like somebody because you don't agree with their ideology and then you say they're not legitimate. Then I ask, I ask Anaya, what makes you legitimate? You know, he said, Modi only got 32% of the votes, or 33%, this was in 2014. I said, you only got 800 votes, dude, out of 8,000, and you got only 150 votes more, more than your rival, so you are legitimate, and the Prime Minister of India is not legitimate, and my other friends, you know, Umar Khalid and Anir Ban, they are from a breakaway group of people's war. I mean, they don't believe in the Indian constitution. People who are supporting Afzal Guru don't believe, and I'm saying, you guys are calling this judicial murder. It makes no sense. Okay, you, you, you've said a bunch of things. Firstly, the I'm not sure how many people in our audience actually know that the cadets of the NDA get their degrees from JNU. Uh, so when we attach Seven the phrase, and, yeah, I just named the NDA as an example. So when we attach the phrase anti-national to JNU, that's just one of the many ironies to, to, to underline here. Secondly, people don't read well, they read Twitter. Uh, that is unfortunately the reductionist quality to our uh, discourse. Uh, and that was evident in a very funny story before I get to the serious part that you actually tell in your book about how at this infamous or famous, depending on your politics, uh, meet that is happening, um, uh, Aga Shahid's famous poem, uh, who's a Kashmiri poet, which is called The Country Without a Post Office, and it is, of course, about Kashmir and identity and the absence of nationhood from Aga Shahid is a Kashmiri Muslim's perspective. And then, of course, all these arrests happen, and Makarand has this hilarious uh, recounting. Why don't you recount it? Let me not steal your thunder. No, I just wanted to say that somebody actually put an RTI to the minister, and at that time, the minister in charge was our honorable vice president, Venkaya Naiduji, saying, is there actually no post office in, in JNU? And, uh, sorry, in, uh, there is one in JNU too. In Kashmir. But in Kashmir, and they said, oh, there are 23,000 post offices, blah, blah. So, people could not understand the difference I mean, it's an example of metaphor. what you're saying, that people don't exactly. read. Exactly. Now, here are the serious questions, right? You, yes, you don't use the phrase tukre tukre, you say it's in the blurb. Is it a phrase that you believe in? Is it a phrase that you think captures something that is authentic? Because from my point of view, campuses anywhere should be anti whatever establishment there is. It doesn't matter to me whether it's Modi or the CPM government or Mamta Banerjee. If at 18, 20, you're not basically calling, looking at every institution of power with some skepticism, some cynicism, some contempt, you're not living your youth. 
See, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> you know, okay. I don't think that anti, you establishment. know, establishment yeah. is the default culture of any campus. No, I've been to all, I've been all over the world, okay? Mm. And the, the, so, I mean, but let's say I agree with you because, you know, we have or to... Or shades of it. I'm not yes. saying that's the only definitive quality of campus life. Yes. I'm saying that's, I that's agree. your that's age late. when you're having arguments. You I haven't agree. lived life. Yes. You're imagining life to be a certain way I and agree. you're having that, arguments. That's what I'm saying. Let me concede for the sake okay. of, you know, because I want to take this forward. Yeah. But that's not what was happening. That's the whole point. It was not a healthy anti-authoritarianism. It was a planned, you know, student rebellion like Navnirman Samiti or even that's all right. I mean, so what? If you did it properly, you know, they unseated a government in Gujarat and etc. These things have happened. But I felt, I felt that something else was going on. I mean, there was this, uh, you know, these so-called leftists were a front, okay? They were being supported by mainstream opposition parties. This was happening in Hyderabad. This was happening all over India. And now to your question, see, Tukri Tukri is not, you know, it's just something that catches on. But separatism, absolutely. I mean, there were these separatist cells. Kashmir separatists had these, they had infiltrated campuses in you know, different parts of India and they were using fronts, like in Hyderabad, they were using Dalit students. This is how Rohit Vemula thing happened, partly. And it's not that 2016 was the first time they did it. They had done it earlier, but at that time it was a UPA government, nobody bothered. The vice chancellors earlier, in fact, our vice chancellor prior to that was Professor Shopori, he's himself a Kashmiri. And there was a protest even then and nobody did anything. What happened this time is obviously the ABVP stood up and said, you, you can't do this. There was a clash and it became, it became viral. And I got involved because I made a simple point at the Sahit Academy annual conference, you know, it was called there, you know, whatever, festival of letters. I said this whole Julus was under false pretext. Why did I say that? Because they never said they wanted to commemorate Afzal Guru in the letter they wrote to the Dean of Students, who was my friend, okay, they said we want to do a poetry reading on, you know, a country without a post office. Then they put up a poster. In the poster it said to commemorate the judicial murder of Afzal Guru. I've put the poster in the book. And then the so-called authorities, the Dean of Students, the associates, they said, Ye kya ho hai? So they withdrew the permission and they went ahead anyway. So. My point is these people, whoever they are, they do not respect either the Indian state or the constitution or the rule of law within, the J, within JNU too. And all of this is countenanced or justified in the name of ideology. And I think you brought up that word and I want to put it out there. My point is ideology has two senses if you read Marx. One is of course it's an organized, you know, thought uh, process with, you know, uh, a point of view. But ideology, as Marx said, is also false consciousness. So I define ideology as something that cannot be falsified. So religion is full of false ideologies because you can never falsify it. You'll keep believing in it even if, the, even if it goes against science, it goes against economics, because it's a matter of faith. Therefore, just to finish the point, what I'm really trying to say, why are we staring at a dark age? We are staring at a dark age because ideologies have, and political correctness and wokeism and all these things have overtaken critical thinking and creativity. And people are being silenced. You cannot say things. You cannot question certain things. The moment you question them, you are branded and you are silenced. But you know what you've just described Many people would say that that is what they are at the receiving end by an extremely aggressive, sometimes militant right wing. That's what I agree with. What and I'm trying to say is both sides yeah. are doing this and it's an escalating war of competing intolerances. And that is why and as a, as a mm. person who is, my whole life is dedicated to ideas, it's alarming to me that when I have a student who, who writes to me saying, sir, I do not want to, 
do my PhD with you because of the stand, uh, stance you took. This is terrible. This is what's happening now. So I, uh, I agree that cancel culture is a plague or, you know, or, uh, that we should all speak up against because if you're going to support one kind of cancelling, there's only a matter of time before something you do or say or believe in is cancelled. And I agree and I think we've seen uh, you know, liberal voices like J.K. Rowling, for example, go through it, the author of the Harry Potter series, uh, because she happened to make a, a, a comment saying that, you know, gender can be chosen, sex is a, a fact of biology, and the trans community then went after her in such a way that she eventually needed security. So I'm not here to defend cancel culture, but I'm reminded of uh, something Javed Akhtar once said to me, and he said, you know, he's an atheist, and he said, but I don't understand why do Hindus want to be like the Islamists they abhor. Hinduism has always, uh, Hindus have always prided themselves on being a philosophy, not a religion of the book, all accommodating, in which atheism is also a part of Hinduism and so on. But the codified, aggressive, militant way in which is being templated today is actually very much like the orthodox Islamist culture that Hindus, many Hindus say they are opposed to. Do you not see that irony? Do you not see that what you described could be true of the left, but is in fact true much more of the right today? No, I don't say much more or much less because the history of communism is a history of bloodshed, okay? And uh, in JNU, these things are not discussed. So I write about it, Frank Decotter's tetralogy about, you know, China under Mao, how many people died? 40, 50 million people died in the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. What happened in the gulags of the Soviet Union? How many people were sent to their deaths? More than for crimes committed, for ideological reasons uh, were sent to their deaths. The Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia, this is because, you see, you can justify anything in the name of ideology, whether it's Islamism, you can justify anything. You call somebody a kafir, you can do anything to them. The, the Catholic Church did it. They smashed the Incas, the Mayas and the Aztecs. You know, you go to those places and if you go to Cusco in Peru, the main cathedral is built on the ruins of an Aztec shrine. So this was done universally, okay? Now, should I say that Hindutva is as bad as communism? I don't think so. Not yet. Not yet. It can be. Who knows? And I hope it won't be. But here's the point I'm trying to make. See, I don't think Indians as, a, as, as you know, by and large, because I feel I understand this country a bit, you know. I don't think we are so taken by ideology. I travel like you do. I mean, you travel much more and I admire your mojo and, you know, real mojo, your courage. I don't travel as much as you do, but I also make it my hobby, if not my business, to understand what's happening in the country. People don't care for ideology that much. They want good governance, you see. And the ideology is riding piggyback on good governance, on delivery to the last woman and last man and so forth. So, here's my thesis. I mean, I'm almost ideology agnostic because for me, it doesn't matter. I'm interested in integrity, you know, and there's so much of self-criticism in the left. Also, the Frankfurt School, other people did it. You know, it's a way of thinking. It's not a substitute for thinking, as D.D. Kosambi said. But we, don't, we didn't do it in, in JNU. And when you mention these things, you mention, you know, Arthur Kersler, Darkness at Noon. Nobody bothers, nobody's read it. So this whole one-sided thing when the Kashmiris were driven out, pundits and Hindus, nobody in JNU did a protest, but they'll do a protest in Palestine. So this one-sided, lopsided land of lotus eaters goes against the fundamental purpose of a university. Why is it you don't question authority there? Why is China still some homeland? And believe it or not, you watch that uh, YouTube uh, exchange where Kanaya Kumar suddenly became the chair of a session where a teacher was speaking. What business did he have? And, you know, the other colleagues who were running the show, uh, they said, you know, oh, the student union and the teachers union have merged for this event. And it's against the constitution 
of the teachers association to merge with the student union for a political purpose. The whole thing was staged and there were placards being moved around, you know, and uh, there was an attempt to destabilize what I was saying. So, here's the point. And what did Kanaya Kumar do? He invited a Chinese student to speak for seven minutes. You can see it's on YouTube. And I was not given a chance to reply because I had said certain things about China. So, you can see the slanting and the sledging. That's why I'm saying, Barkha, I'm really deeply interested in integrity. I don't care what your ideology is. If, you know, in our culture, you know, we make a difference between an ideologue and an exemplar. Mm. So, an ideologue is someone who, you know, spouts a certain view, but his personal life, his experience are at variance or at odds with them. In India, we respect exemplars, which means anubhav or anubhuti, achar and vichar. Usme ek surta honi chahiye. In other words, there has to be a consistency. And that's one reason I admire Gandhi. And today they want to take him down too. You know, so here's the point. I am all for a diverse, diversity, even divergence of views ideologically, but have integrity, stand up for the, you know, things you really you, believe you, in. You call out hypocrisy and I would, I would, I would join that uh, distaste for humbug and hypocrisy. But, you know, there's a, there's a line, uh, talking about China, by the way, uh, Sham Sarana, former foreign secretary, had a great line just, just recently and he said, you know, Indians or certain section of Indians need to get over dictator envy. And I thought that was, that was well put about China. But there's a line in your book which says, the, I, I'm paraphrasing it, uh, the age of the self-hating Hindu is over, right? That I, I'm quoting from the book. What do you mean by this? Uh, I also hope, Barkha, that uh, we have not inaugurated the age of the other hating Hindu. Yes, and I was going to I ask hope you that because I think happen. that there is an othering that yeah, is happening we, of non-Hindus. Be because I, I want to say this very clearly. You see, we have to be ourselves. If we are Sanatanis, you know, and in my other work, I have actually sketched this out. There are Sanatanis, then there are co-Sanatanis, because many people don't want to be called Sanatanis. So I call them co-Sanatanis, Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs, even Charvaks, they are co-Sanatanis. Then there are non-Sanatanis, Marxists are non-Sanatanis, Muslims are non-Sanatanis, Christians, Jewish people, modern people are non-Sanatanis, fine. I don't say atheists are non-Sanatani, because belief in a God is not essential. But then there are anti-Sanatanis, you know, so that means when you're confronted with somebody who wants to destroy your civilization, and that happened, please, let's not try to airbrush it. I invite everyone in this room to read the Chachnama, okay? The Chachnama is an account of the invasion of Sindh, okay, by Muhammad ben Qasim. It was written a couple of hundred years later, but that's the only historical source we have. Please read the Muslim historians. Okay, don't read Irfan Habib or Ramila Thapar, read their own historians. They're all available, free. Go to archive.com, read. So, they, they, you see, let's not please understand. This civilization was under attack. It still is under attack. Hindus are being killed today in Kashmir for being Hindus, for no other reason. And when Mahbubah Mufti says Muslims are also being killed, I'll tell you why they're being killed. When the government servants, when the police people, they are being killed, not ordinary. So, here's the point. The point is, we cannot, we cannot win or even defeat the anti-Sanatanis by becoming anti-Sanatanis ourselves. We can't. We have to stand up for who we are. And I go to Gandhi because Gandhi said, you know, adapting Tulsi and other great people. He said, there is Bahubal, which is the strength of arms. You have all the rockets and the drones and the missiles in the world. And then there is Buddhibal, you know, smarts. Israel, very smart. They are smarter than everybody, as far as I can tell. And then you have Atmabal. This is Sanatanism. I believe in Atmabal. And I am not afraid. I am not a Hindu who is insecure or afraid. I think Hinduism will last forever, not because we are protecting it. I am not even sure that people in India really understand what it is. I but, but because all over the world, People have understood, you okay. know, uh, the, the point is, it is about transforming your consciousness and really as, as a race, as a human race, I want to say this, 
unless there is a consciousness revolution and the path to the future lies through the past because it is these ancient people you know call them sanatanis call them hindus call them rishis and it's not exclusive to us i think egyptians had it the kabbala had it we have to unless human beings choose to be more like angels than beasts read the essay on man by pope yeah. beautiful poem by a, by a, you know augustan poet we have to choose you want to be a beast of course beasts are beautiful okay the beast <laughs> beasts do not kill and hoard and you know save for tomorrow so don't say beast but i'm saying or, or or should human beings you know so so so, th- so let me let me bring up the non muslims who are being killed in kashmir a bank a hindu bank manager was killed caught on cctv camera today a school teacher was killed right before that rajni who's uh, you know whose family asked for her to be transferred out four times before that there was rahul a government official then we could carry on uh, naming them it's clearly targeted killings this leads me to a intriguing sort of question this dangerous conflation between anti government and anti national they're not the same thing now i can be a very nationalist indian and hold the modi government to account on what is happening with these pandits as many pandits are doing themselves but the moment you say this today so much as the space shrunk so much is the space shrunk that even kashmiri pandits who are criticizing the government online today for what is happening to their people are being called names and therefore i ask you this dangerous phrase anti national what does it mean who is a nationalist according to you no so i completely agree we elect our lawmakers we have every right not only to criticize them but to vote them out of power and for anyone to say that to to be anti a particular individual or a particular party or to question the government automatically makes you anti national is i think it's not only illogical but it goes against the very spirit of democracy but here's the thing this is politics and you know i always say this because people try to draw me into political controversies i'm not a politician i don't belong to any political you're talking about the wider culture exactly of, so of i i think space for no no i think people should see my point is for a democracy to be vibrant people should say look you're not our my babs okay we don't have a divine right of kings here we elect you guys and it's our money it's taxpayers money that you're using for whatever development you're doing so please let's not be statist and let's because see there's a difference between being statist mm. okay and uh, what is this phrase anti national you can use it if you don't like somebody you call them anti national but we shouldn't why are we getting trapped in these labels we shouldn't i think my point because is because in yeah. those whatsapp family groups where my family mm. will say i don't want to go in here makran then your family will say i don't want to go in here barkha these whatsapp forwards have generated a kind of othering of any opinion that is not our own no, that's why i'm saying that all intelligent people critical people should be against weaponized uh, you know information and that's what universities are for for critical thinking and not for digital colonization and in fact i was just saying to somebody that what's interesting in today's world not just in india is it's much easier much cheaper to try to massage the narrative than to do real things on the ground so suppose you're feeling miserably on any objective parameter let's say whether it's in the us or europe or wherever we are or in ukraine or in russia or in china you can manage the narrative in china you can manage the narrative whether it's covid or because you can control the all the information channels in china they've got censorship but in india and elsewhere i mean look at cnn and fox can you trust these people can you trust journalists no i don't trust journalists at all in fact the quality of information is so poor today so unreliable but, but on the on the flip side as journalists today if you do not confirm somebody's bias you are biased it, it has never been a more suffocating time 
to be a journalist than today because you are expected to deliver to people's polarized expectations of you. No, and if you choose, Barkha. as I do, to, no, no. to, to, no, to stubbornly be my, just, yeah. just a sentence, Please. to stubbornly Please. be myself, uh, you know, I, I, I was saying to th uh, the other day at, at another event, I said I'm loved but in phases. And what I meant by that was there are issues on which one group of people will love me because I'm confirming their bias. And then suddenly if I'm not confirming this bias, their bias, that same group of people will tell me, oh, you're such a sellout. No, listen, Barkha, please. You were the most admired journalist in India at one time, okay? This is not about me. No, no, let's one minute. No, 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 let's no, make a general one, point. One, one, this is not I, about I'm, me. I'm coming, I'm coming let's to the point. Let's make a general point. I'm, I'm coming to the point. <laughs> Allow me. Okay. Well, just one more question. Is it not, I, I hold no brief for the media. I, I've been disillusioned with large uh, aspects of the mainstream media myself, which is why I decided to do my own thing. However, there's a lot that's wrong with the Indian media. That doesn't change the fact that our audiences and our readers today, more than ever before, expect us to be mirror images of their politics. No, hang on, that's exactly what I'm saying. Why should you be? But okay. here's the thing. I think that the press is a pillar of democracy because without the press, hundreds of things wouldn't have happened. It's a great safeguard. But unfortunately, you know, like academics, I'm not saying academics are holier than thou. We are compromised, you see. I mean, look at you. You interviewed Kanaya Kumar as an alternative to Modi, as a youth leader. I saw your two-hour program. And I could have told you. I, I, I don't oh, think I saw him as an alternative to Modi, no. and I couldn't have done a two-hour program. One second, one both hour, of these one are, both one of these are your add-ons. No, no, yeah. please, you can verify it. You had a very of long I interview, him. and you were so admiring but when you looked you, at him. No, no, hang on. Let me finish. Let me finish. People you interview are not your political choices. Otherwise, no. we'd be interviewing a very see, small group of people. See, when you make a choice, you take credit for it. But when you're, you know, arm twisted or whatever by the media house, you say, oh, it's not my choice. But listen, I write for so many media houses, okay? I have some insight into this. What I'm saying is everything is slanted. Every, you can't trust. That's what I'm saying. CNN, can you trust them? They'll give you one view. Can you trust Fox? You can't. Who's better than the other? I don't know. But here's so the So who do you trust? No, no. I trust my own capacity. Exactly. One exactly. minute. L let me finish. Therefore, therefore, what I'm saying is that people have benefited and collaborated with ecosystems which are funded. See, I have 99,000 followers on Twitter. Do I believe that 99,000 people follow me? I don't. Most of them must be bots. I don't think I'm important. But you didn't organize those bots, right? I didn't organize, but, exactly. but somebody, listen, mm. I believe or I surmise mm. that some people think that my point of view suits them. So who knows? I mean, I've never paid a cent to promote myself, but tomorrow I might if I want a bigger profile. So do I trust Twitter? No. Does Elon Musk trust Twitter? No, because he's saying, you're, you, he's challenging them to prove that they say only 5% are bots, but I think 50% might be. Do you trust Facebook? No. See, they are targeting you. They are co collecting information about you, about your choices, what kind of handbags you're buying, which restaurants you go to, what you buy on Amazon. Therefore, what I'm trying to say is that the media in India is also, you know, aligned, like you, I don't name houses, but one channel will be very anti somebody or something, another channel will be very pro, the print media will be very left, let's say, uh, and the, you know, whatever, the visual media or the TV will be opposite. Everyone's hedging their bets. Why is big business buying everything? Everything is bought by, you know, two or three houses. So, here's the thing, I'm coming back to this kind of audience. We have to be very aware, we have to be critical, we have to sift the true from the false, we have to teach our children to think for themselves. Everybody says, oh, change the textbooks. I say, no. I say, get rid of this exam system when only one answer is right. Why should only one answer be right in humanities and social studies? Any answer which is well thought out and well substantiated should be given marks. Therefore, what I'm trying to say when I'm saying we're on the brink of another dark age, it's precisely these things and it's precisely 
a more, should I say, enabled, materially and intellectually enabled class, call them the middle class or the upper class, we have such a great responsibility. Mm. But Barkha, we are not breeding, I'm sorry to use the crude word. Mm. We don't get, ma I mean, we don't get married in well into our thirties, we have very few children. So what's happening to the world? What's going to happen, unfortunately, as we progress, there's going to be a huge divide, huge divide, information divide, digital divide, economic divide, almost like A.G. Wells. Or have you seen this film Elysium, where Matt Damon, you know, leads a revolt from the earth to this, uh, you know, there's a spaceship where all the rich people live. Gurgaon is a bit like that. You know, I mean, I want, all I'm saying is, the young people of today and people like us should think deeply about these matters and our children, sh you know, we should not be divided, you know, whatever it is on ideological grounds. Our children should be, you know, encouraged to question. We should have mealtime discussions and in a way the future depends on it. And the future does not depend on massaging the narrative, political correctness, sledging and being slimy and slanting everything, it really depends on integrity, okay, honestly. And uh, I think that's, that's what's really important. And I think my book, and I'm talking about intermedial hermeneutics, that you must steer between these polarizing positions because they are so reductive that you can be almost sure yeah, that, that no they're not true. Yeah. And here's the beauty of it that almost everything you say, every categorical statement you make, the opposite will also be slightly true. And I think you have to ventilate, you have to give voice to that truth in the opposite of what you believe. And you have to accept, Barkha, my position is not complete and, and neither is yours, so we need each other for a dialogue. I, we, I, we, yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, in fact, I say this all the time that when did we cease to be people who could converse um, uh, without labels, you know, and without making assumptions already of what the other person is going to think or feel. Uh, I do need to open it for questions, but I have one last question to you and then I, I'll take this forward. You know, you have argued about the place of history and I think I, I read something you wrote where you said, okay, it's okay to say don't keep going back to history, but can you pretend that history did not take place? Now we have a very volatile conversation in this country today about mosques and temples. And we see that Gyanvapi is in, in, in court evoking a kind of deja vu about the Ayodhya years. Now in Mathura also we are seeing a similar conversations. These conversations have now made their way to the Kutub and the Taj. We cannot also decontextualize all of this happening at a time when certainly many Indian Muslims would say they feel politically marginalized. And I'm not even talking about the other sort of incidents of violence that we see often caught on camera against religious minorities, Hindus in Kashmir, Muslims in other parts of the country. How do you see this debate? How far back should a country in contemporary times go back to whether there was a temple there or not before the mosque was built? See, Barkha, thousands of temples were destroyed in India and not just India, in many parts of the world, okay? Because some of these religious ideologies, they theologically endorse this kind of vandalism, okay? Now the West, which was Christian in a way, its DNA was Christian, they're woken up. If you go to Rome, they're reconstructing those so-called pagan shrines, okay? But where is a statement from the ulema saying, you know, it's so sad that these beautiful temples were destroyed in the name of a religious ideology? Nobody says it. They're still denialable denialism and neg negationism and Gyanvyapi, look at that uh, shivaling where political leaders elected to the parliament are saying it's a fountain. Is it a fountain? You know there's an overlay on that stone of another color with five cuts, there's no channel for the water. Why are we lying? Why don't we say yes this was destroyed and thousands of temples were destroyed. And does it mean we'll take revenge? No. 
Because if you agree that most of the subcontinental Muslims were themselves victims of this violence, many were converted under duress because there was jazia, you know, and if you didn't convert, you could be sold into slavery. So why are we in, in denial? Why don't we have our own Truth and Reconciliation Commission? You know, by the way, the Jews, the Jewish people, you know, they never forget. They are a culture of remembering. That's why there's the Wailing Wall, okay? Wherever they were in the world, they never forgot. But the Hindus are a culture which forgets. Why? Because why should you remember everything? We are not a, we are not a historical people. We are Akalis, you know, at this very moment, I want to feel my eternity. I want to be free of time and space. I want to connect with the, I want to connect with a limitless and boundless experience of myself, okay? At this moment, as I talk to you, my consciousness wants to expand. That is who we are now. But forgetting can be strategic. Amnesia can be strategic. Remembrance can also be strategic. I think a little bit of remembrance is good. Why is it, I'll tell you in my class, I'm doing a course on, you know, post-colonialism and I've completely changed the course. I've said, okay, please read, please read Babar Nama, okay? Read Al-Baruni, read Badawni, I get, you know, read the, nobody wants to do it. Read Chachnama, I'm asking all of you, please read the, nobody wants to read it, why? Simply is this, why are we so afraid? Let this come out. Why are we in denial? You know, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm, I don't believe in revenge histories. You know, you cannot take some defenseless person and beat him up and say, Bolo Jai Shri Ram or Bolo Bharat Mata Ki Jai. That's absurd because he himself is a victim. And you, you dare not do it to some rich and powerful person. You'll only do it to some, mm. you know. And this is our, our sad system. And, and that's know? what I was going to ask you. That should, should the Indian Muslim today be answerable for what Aurangzeb did? Why is she answerable? No, but for? let them not endorse it. No? Let them say this is so sad. I mean, maybe they're saying nothing. I'm not talking about the Muslim person. No, law they board. are I'm afraid. They are afraid Af because if they say it, the ulema, whoever. Now the Devbandis had a meeting, you know, and look. Our secularism was deeply flawed because we are using state money to fund madarsas even today where things are being taught which are completely contrary to modern science. Why are we doing it? Because it's the politics of appeasement. We send people to Hajj on state subsidies. Why did we do it? The answer is not what our great chief minister does to send people on Hindu pilgrimages. I was just no. going to say that no, now no, you no. have... No, that's not the pilgrimages answer. Pilgrimages to Ayodhya no, funded by look, Mr. Why should People go on pilgrimages on their own. Why should the state pay for it? Here's the point. The opposite of, of appeasement is not aggression. Okay, it is be fair. That's my point. But be fair, why are you constantly in denial when things happen? And you can't be in denial because you go to any museum in India. I challenge you to show me any image which is not defaced. Show me. Where are these images which are not defaced? A hand is broken, a nose is broken. It's all over the world. You go to Athens, you'll see it. You go to the Topkapi Museum, you'll see it. Because the vandalism, the ancient world, okay, the classical world was destroyed. And Mao did the last bit of it. And these were all, I call them versions of monotheism. Marxism is a version of monotheism. It has its own salvation theology. Okay. So, please, let us not be in denial. That's my only point. But let, uh, does that mean you start punishing people? No, that's absurd. D does it mean you create a state of permanent tension? Mm. Keep the pot boiling forever? No, I think that's going to be really bad for the country. I mean, people want to... Do you feel that's happening? Well, they're ratcheting it up and I was surprised that Ram Navmi became... Uh, a time when they did it. I thought they did it only for elections. Yeah. See, the point is this, but the answer is you should create a polity where polarization will be voted out. Can you do that? Then you're a Democrat. There's no point. See, when people divided and won votes, you said that's fine. But now when people are uniting, say the Hindu vote bank, you say that's not fair. 
why is that not fair when Akbaruddin Oasi goes to Aurangzeb's grave, you know, and it says, oh, it's an ASI monument. Excuse me, why are you doing religious activities in an ASI monument? I've been to Aurangzeb's grave, by the way. It's in Khuldabad. Okay, you go to Khuldabad, it's a necropolis, you know, of the Sufis next to the old capital, Devgiri, you know, which then became Dalatabad. So, I want all Indians to go and see. We are on a heap of rubble. I'm telling you this Gurgaon, you dig, you dig a bit and you'll see right under your backyard, you'll find an idol, you'll find some remnants of what happened here. And this is a blood-soaked history, by the way, you know. And this is something we have to come to terms with. That's my point. And by the way, Barkha, I want to end on a positive note. Hindus and Muslims must learn to coexist. Must learn to coexist. We have to work the terms out. And my suggestion is this. I think subcontinental Muslims must ask themselves, do they want to be a part of the Arab story or some other story? Or do they want to be a part of the Hindu story? Okay? And because should Hindus also ask themselves something? Uh, Hindus should say, don't you want the Muslims to be a part of your story? Because, you know, they are your, you know, you say, okay, what is the nation? It comes from the word jati. That means you have common ancestry. You know, Mohan Rao Bhagwat always says we have the same blood. So I want Muslims to be a part of my story. You know, why, why do I want to other them? I don't want to other them. So, we need this covenant and we need to prosper. We can only prosper when there's peace and cooperation, okay? And we have to make, we have to make our own culture attractive to everybody. We, we can't make it, uh, you know, uh, whatever, so offensive that nobody wants to be a part of our story. Because the Hindu story is not the Western story, it's not the Chinese story, it's not the Jewish story, it's not the Muslim story, it's not the Christian story. You know, I've written about it in my other book on, on Vivekananda. We want to be modern, but we can't be modern like the West is modern, okay? It's our own story. We have to figure it out. We have to figure out who we are. And at this moment, we seem to be figuring out in, it, it in ways that, that make many of us concerned, as you opened this conversation by saying, but let's open this up for questions. Yeah, Paramita? Um, can, well, once again, I think the mic is just coming. To, yeah. Why does it need to be a Hindu story or a Muslim story or a Christian story? One, why can't it be an India story? Correct. Number one. Secondly, this whole anti-national culture, I mean, who started it? And for every Hindu example you give, there's a counter example. Okay, well, hang on, he wants to answer the first question. Yeah, no, I'm just going no. to do, because I'm not going to ask another one. People. But Oramita, the first question is so important, please. Yeah, but then, the second you know, question is more on, predictable. Let him okay. answer, then he wants. Okay. Uh, it uh, is uh. so important. Look, if you read Arnold Toynbee, I mean, either you're going to have a civilizational discourse or you don't. I'm not talking about Huntington. Read Spengler. You know, the DNA of most civilizations I don't want to use the word religious. It's deep cultural DNA comes from these things. You, you, if you don't want to call it Hindu, call it Indian. But the word Indian comes from Indica. And it comes from Sindhu. You know, it comes from the Indus. The Indus is Sindhu. The Sapta Sindhu, Hafta Hindus. This is from the Vedas. I think I want to use the word Hindu. You know, for many years I didn't use the word Hindu. I used the word Indian because Hindus were so apologetic, appallingly apologetic. They never used the word Hindu. As if the word Hindu gives offense to somebody. And I said, no, I'm going to start using that word because there's nothing wrong with that word. And if you use Hindu in the cultural sense, in the civilizational sense, you know, you can be a Hindu Muslim, you can be a... Hindu Buddhist, you can be a Hindu Sikh, you can be a Hindu Christian, and they are Christianity's ecumenism. I'm a, I'm a student of these things. I love to study these things. You know, St. Stephen's College was founded by the Cambridge Brotherhood. Who were they? They were, they were an evangelic, evangelical mission, okay? They wanted to evangelize India. So, here's my story. Here's my, sorry, not story, my answer. You call it Indian, I don't mind, but behind it is the same thing. And why am I calling it Muslim? Why am I not calling it Arab? Because there was a sense of a Muslim ecumeny. 
and there was a caliphate and Gandhi said bring the caliphate back. Can you imagine what a strange thing it was? So don't call it Christian but they call themselves Christian Democrats. I am simply talking from a point of view of an Indian citizen. It is a secular country. We have had 800 years of uh, Muslim rule if I may say so and 100 years of the British. So how do, how do we overnight become a Hindu civilization and, and you know I mean for every academic example you throw I mean I probably can throw one back at you. I am not going to do that because other people want to ask questions I am sure. But this I mean this whole idea of trying to make a Hindu nation state I find it deeply flawed and very very dangerous. I completely agree with you that this is a cancel culture and we are deeply polarized and I'm not going to say one community is responsible over the other. It is a very dangerous state to be but I mean this whole Hindu nationalistic polity that we are now looking at is the most dangerous thing of it all. Thanks. Okay, I'm not talking about you know the nation state but Please remember one thing that secularism comes out of Christianity, okay? Secularism is an invention, you know, of a European Christian society. Therefore, I use these words as categories of thought, okay? And you can call yourself anything. You call yourself a secular country, but you had appeasement. For such a long time, there was no separation of church and state. By church here, I mean religious bodies. You had Shahbano, you had personal laws, you had triple talaq. Why, if you're a secular country, why did you have all of that? So, I don't believe there are purely secular spaces. And if you think that the CCP is a purely secular space, I think, you know, it's like a religion. But can I, can I ask a follow-up here before the next question? There are also phobias that are fueled that are not rooted in fact. For example, the population debate. We now know conclusively from the data that while the Muslims had a higher fertility rate, they now have, because of their large numbers, the fall is also steepest within the Muslim community. Yet the number of people you will meet today who will tell you, you know, the, Hindu, the Muslims will outnumber the Hindus one day in this country. This is not, and you, you know, you're a person of science and fact. You know this is not true. No, Yet it this is, is. It is, I'm sorry. It is not true. You, it depends on what facts you're looking at. I mean, at. I'm no, only quoting. No, no, ju just one second. From you know? the government's own no, family no, survey no, no, data. No, 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 The Pew Research look Center. Own, no, no, listen, you can't S. look. S.Y. Qureshi's book, three sources I've no, no, given you. I'm, I'm trying to say something. Of course, S.Y. Qureshi, we know what he's trying to prove. I read his book. See, my, my point is very simple. Look at the demographics in, say, 1900, then look at it at 1947. And the demographics tell you a story. Look at how many Muslims there were in Pakistan, undivided in West Pakistan, in East Pakistan. The numbers are clear. Now, what do you do about it? Now, today I read in the papers, the government is going to come up with a population control policy. You know, is that going to solve the problem? I don't know. So I, I think that demographics and taking over countries or places through a population expansion has been a part of Islam right from the beginning. I'll tell you how. You conquer a country, then you take slaves and then the children of the slaves also become Muslims and it expanded like that. This is a fact and it's happening in Europe where countries like Netherlands did not have even one percent, even one quarter of a percent of Muslims have 10 percent, 7 percent. But we France. are talking about people no, who… India who as well. Take the subcontinent, Barkha, take the subcontinent. I'm talking about India. I don't know the figures for the but subcontinent. Are, but I'm a subcontinental, okay? Ah, okay. Look but at in all the India, figures. which we is my not, country. No, no, listen, we are not isolated because what is happening in Kashmir is happening because of a neighborhood. Can't, you course. can't say, okay, look at what's no, happening no, no, in Gurgaon. Of course, what's happening in Kashmir yeah. is because of Pakistan. So but I linked. don't know about the data of no, Pakistan no. in terms of their growth rates. But we do. No, no. Look, they are growing faster than us. Both Pakistan and Bangladesh are growing faster than India and they have. Please understand that there were, at the, at the turn of the last century, okay, there were about 300 million 
people in India, out of them, you know, about 15% subcontinentally or so were Muslims. And today, there's about 200 million Muslims in India, 200 million Muslims in Bangladesh, and 200 million Muslims in Pakistan, roughly, ballpark. We have 600 million Muslims in the subcontinent, and we have a billion Hindus, roughly. I mean, even if I'm off by 100 million, just think about it, okay? Don't believe a word I say. I never, I'm not a propagandist. I don't want to convince anybody because I'm not winning votes. I'm not here to convince anyone about anything. But I'm here to make you question or think through some of this. And if you think that demographics is not an issue, look at Lebanon. When no, Lebanon, I'm saying look the demographics over the tell world. you a different story. We're and drawing, it's happening, it's happening. You and I are drawing different no, conclusions from the data. No, it's happening the other way. See, in UAE, there are three and a half million Indians, of which I suspect maybe a couple of million will be Hindus. There are many more Hindus in UAE than Arabs, but they can't ever become citizens, ever. So, I'm saying demographics works in different ways. Of course, but do we it want to be UAE? We don't want to be China, UAE, Pakistan or Bangladesh, we no, want no, to be India. No, 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 I'm saying something else. I'm saying that demographics is a factor in politics. It is a factor in votes. In, in, in Assam, many districts changed. Uh, you know, and the denotification, it's yeah. highly contentious because if you draw a district in a certain way and you have 30% of Correct. the votes and you can have the most fanatical elements leading those 30%. So these are very dangerous trends and border districts, go to Mushirabad, there are many people here, I have friends who have come from Khulna. You go to, go to all the people, all the Hindus who have come from Bangladesh. See what has happened to their ancestral homes. Hindus have been leaving Bangladesh. Even in JNU, there are Hindu students from Bangladesh. They do not want to go back. These are facts. Now, these facts we may not like, but we have to confront them. Okay, there's That's another question point. at the back. Yes. Uh, can you speak into the mic? Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So just related to the point you just made about taking all of South Asia and the population, but don't you think that uh, 75 years ago we split into two countries and the way the polarization is going and the way you are talking about denotification and delimitation and redrawing of district boundaries, we're going to have another partition if this polity continues this way, if the discourse continues this way? You know, this is a very serious question and uh, I just wanted to say that partition did not happen accidentally. It didn't happen because of denotification or, you know, the equivalent in those days of Twitter or Facebook. It happened because a large group of people mobilized and organized and then intervened directly like, you know, direct action day, this, that and the other. And because the Congress and the British said that partition was preferable to civil war. But we did have civil war. We had bloodshed that was unimaginable. I've written another book called The Death and Afterlife of Mahatma Gandhi. And I'll, I'll, you can please read the book where Gandhi admits that his nonviolence failed. And it is he who said, airlift the troops to Kashmir. Why would he do that? He who's talking about a Shanti Sena because he realizes that you know, people are not ready for nonviolence. He goes to a mosque in Darya Ganj and says, surrender your weapons. Let the state be the only one which has violence in its hands so that at least you can stop the mobs from killing each other. So, my whole point is that another partition of India, I mean, needs a kind of mobilization and, a, and, a, and a, you know, a, a movement which is supported and funded and it's not, it's not the right wing which is doing it. There, there are already separatists. People, I won't name them, they said there's a chicken neck, you blockade it. Who are these people? Who are saying those things? Now, but to answer your question, really, if you read Uday Mahurkar's book on Savarkar and some of the other Savarkarites who are coming, you know, to the fore today, what they are saying, I mean, I, it took a long time for me to understand this. What they are saying is that we should have fought it out. In other words, in 47, 
their argument is congress shouldn't have acceded and have a war have a sort of civil war like the americans did they fought over slavery but they saved the union because they are saying that bloodshed did take place in you know instead of mobs rioting so this is a point of view now i may or may not agree i don't i haven't examined it but but there are other ways of thinking through that history and when it comes to the left what did the muslim league uh, sorry what did the communist party of pakistan do they merged with the muslim league okay so the leftist theory of multinational india which is what the congress and others subscribe to it doesn't quite work try and sell it to china they believe in one china and many indias and therefore what i'm trying to say is secessionism has been prevented by most nation states through incredible violence the right to self determination sounds wonderful on paper but it's not granted in reality look at what russia did to chechnya look at what us did okay and any other country of course the referendum in scotland or in quebec is a different cup of tea altogether because it's not that kind of secessionism that that we faced in india because you know you talk about i ask people where did panini come from he came from afghanistan you know the so called hindus called them so called they were all over the place central asia was buddhist there's not a single hindu left in afghanistan today there were 10 left when the taliban took over 10 or 100 i don't know how many today there's not a single one left these are facts and we can't just ignore it we'll say we are secular okay i'm secular all right but will i be allowed to be secular or will someone say that you have to accede to something or else you know your property your life you know is forfeit i mean there's so much material on this on dimitude look at the christian populations in the middle east do you know that egypt was a christian country do you know that syria had so many christians you know lebanon look at the demographics there so these look at what happened to yazdis to kurds to armenians so these are facts you know and we have to be a con- we have to be conscious of them and we can sleep peacefully here because our borders are being protected otherwise if i were in kashmir i'd be wearing a bulletproof vest today i can tell you that i'm not going to believe that somebody else will protect me if i i'm telling you today i tweeted about it yeah i said please wear if you're a hindu in kashmir wear a bulletproof vest these are facts and kashmir was sought to be taken away from india that's the partition of a second partition was happening there and somehow we have prevented it now for by force of arms you might call it it's armed to the teeth okay there's 30000 troops there yeah sorry i uh, i'm just being told the time is up is there a last question if there's a last question this will be the last question for the evening yeah uh, so the discussion started from jnu and it got to religion as it always does Because i have jnu a, is about all these things. i have a question about jnu barkha mentioned that jnu gives degree to nda the most a political so called organization in this country is the armed forces i am colonel kataria i retired a few years back this uh, the majority of the officer cadre of the armed forces is graduate from jnu jnu doesn't speak about it we don't speak about it probably because we might be thought political or something why is jnu not proud of this fact I should correct you colonel sahab the last vc and etc they made a big big thing about it in fact we give degrees to seven armed forces colleges and institutions including the one in mao including the engineering college in uh, hyderabad and i can't tell you the number of generals and other army people we've had in uh, you know uh, professor jagdish kumar's tenure as vc we have a whole gallery of martyrs and i wrote about this idea of bringing a tank to jnu i said we don't need a tank to instill uh, patriotism but it's the earlier dispensation where it was like a well kept secret because of this so called anti establishment 
left wing politics of JNU, which was always, you know, keeping all of these uh, things under wraps and uh, never talking about these facts. Uh, so I completely agree with you. And coming back to JNU, let me also say that JNU is not a den of anti nationals, okay? Please, this demonizing of JNU is also completely going overboard. In fact, we have two ministers in the cabinet from JNU. We have many bureaucrats of the highest level, secretaries, undersecretaries, joint secretaries, you know, and people in every possible cadre of the government from JNU. And even in the heyday of the protests, the recent protests, there were only a couple of hundred students at the most who, who brought the whole university down. That's what I was trying to say. I want to, you know, study. Let's say I'm a student. I'm a science student. I need to go to the lab. Is it democracy to barricade that lab and lock it up? No. It's anti-democratic. So, on the one hand, you're saying we are democratic. It's our right to dissent. But when someone is dissenting against your dissent, you're throttling them. It's these contradictions that I try to point out in the book. And it is this, it is for this reason that I stood up and spoke when I was invited to give a talk. Well, uh, sorry, I know this can carry on. There's so much to talk about. But uh, just to say, Professor Puranjpa's uh, book is available for sale, signings, more questions, uh, should you have them. Uh, as is my book, uh, which is on a completely different subject on my journeys covering COVID. Uh, so if you'd like to pick up a copy of either of our books or continue this conversation, please do. In conclusion, I only want to say, long may we be able to have civil conversations and amiable disagreements. And, you know, I always say that there was an India I remember growing up in, where you'd have some ferocious argument with your neighbor and then some kindly auntie or uncle would say, Achha, hai, ab samosa kha ke jao. So, I think now is the time to eat your samosa. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for Professor Makhran Paranjpai. And thank you very much.